All right, welcome back to lesson seven, where we're talking about financing. So we're gonna continue on talking about the financing of real estate. And we're gonna talk a little bit about a couple of the forms that we're now using under the new TRID rule. TRID is an acronym for Truth in Lending Real Estate Settlement Procedure Integrated Disclosure. So it's an acronym of acronyms, all right? TRID involves two forms where the old settlement statement and HUD-1 and um, good faith estimate, there were four of those and they've combined them into two new forms. The loan estimate form and the closing disclosure form are the two forms that we have now. So let's look at these two forms and talk about them. So a loan estimate form is the first one of the two government mandated forms. It is only three pages long. Now, this loan estimate form is an estimate of the closing costs that the consumer will pay to buy this property. Now, one of the things I always tell new agents, and I, by now I hope you understand, that if someone is buying a $100,000 house, that there are costs and fees associated with it, and it, they are going to spend more than $100,000. You know, you got recording fees and title insurance and appraisals and credit pulls and uh, taxes and uh, all kinds of other stuff. This loan estimate is that number that we are talking about. In that loan estimate, when a consumer goes to a mortgage broker or a lender or an originator, they must make application. And there is a definite definition for what application is required. We're not gonna go into that. This is not a mortgage class, but there are six pieces of information that the consumer must provide for it to be considered an application. If they do provide an application, then the lender, the mortgage broker, or whoever must issue a loan estimate form within three business days of that application. And that loan estimate form is, uh, details the terms of the loan. It's gonna talk about the expenses of the loan, which is going to allow that buyer to pick and choose certain things. It's going to talk about the projected mortgage payment. It's going to talk about their estimated closing cost and the cash they have to bring. Now, remember, it is an estimated closing cost. All right. And that closing cost is comprised of three numbers. And here's the fun part. Those three numbers, one of them is 0% tolerance, meaning whatever the mortgage broker tells the consumer the number is, that's what the number will be. Like the origination fee, can't change that. Second set of numbers are gonna be things that have a 10% tolerance, like appraisal fees. These are people they recommend, but they don't control their fee. They can be plus or minus 10%. And then that third set of numbers is an infinite tolerance. These are things that they have no idea, don't control the number. These would be things like your homeowner's insurance. So these, all these numbers would go into this loan estimate that must be given to the buyer, okay? And that buyer then has an idea of how much he is going to be spending on that $100,000 purchase, okay? And there are services that they can shop for and some they cannot, all right? So your lender will tell a consumer, hey, you can shop around for this. And if it does, then it falls in the 10% tolerance. If it's something you can't shop for, then it's in the 0% tolerance. So that's the first form called the loan estimate form. And a lot of times you hear that called the LE, okay? That is made by the mortgage broker to the consumer. The second form they will use 
All right, where was I? I lost my place. A train of thought got caught. The second form that we use is called the closing disclosure. The closing disclosure actually has two of them. There's an initial closing disclosure and there's a final closing disclosure. The closing disclosure is the second form of these three right here. It basically provides the same information, but more in a final form. So this means it's going to contain locked in, the locked in numbers that the loan estimate gave as an estimate. Now the key to the initial closing disclosure is that when it is issued, the lender has three days to look at it and approve it for the final closing disclosure. Therefore, you cannot close until three days after the initial closing disclosure is issued. And there's nothing you can do. This is a federal law. You can't try and call a favor in. You can't piss and moan and whine and bitch. If it gets issued on a Monday, there is absolutely no way to close that until three days because the lender under federal law has the right to review it and approve it. Okay, so that is the initial closing disclosure. And then at closing, you will sign the final closing disclosure. Okay, now here's a, a situation. The final actually can change a little bit within a certain tolerance of the initial. If there is a big change called a significant change to the closing disclosure, then certain things get triggered. And that's where problems start to happen, okay? So what you have, there are six things that can actually cause a significant change, all right? And what happens with a significant change means that they get to reissue a new closing disclosure, which in essence starts your three days over again. There's the problem. So if there's a change in the circumstance to a settlement cost, let me give you an example. Say the appraiser is going to be $400, or they say the appraisal is going to be $200 on the uh, closing disclosure. Well, the appraiser gets out there and finds out that what he thought he was going to appraise was a house. It turns out to be a farm. That's a different fee for that. It's now $400. That change from 200 to 400 would be considered a significant change. And what happens in that case is they have to reissue a new closing disclosure and start that three-day clock over. If they fail to issue a new closing disclosure, when they get to the closing, all they can charge is 200. That means the lender now has to pay that difference between the 400 the appraisal, appraiser charged and the 200 the consumer was quoted. Well, lenders don't wanna do that. That's why they change the closing disclosure, okay? <clears throat> if there's a change in the eligibility of the client, like credit change, if there's a change in the credit worthiness of the buyer or his VOE, which is the verification of employment, like he lost his job, which would affect his credit, they can reissue a new closing disclosure again. Now, maybe his credit changed, but he still qualifies, but not at the interest rate of 3.5. He now has to get an interest rate of four because his credit changed. That would trigger a new closing disclosure, which would also trigger <clears throat> a new uh, closing, uh, new three days. The consumer can make a change. For instance, the example that I give in class is, say the consumer can't make it, so he's going to hire a POA to go power of attorney for him. Well, the title company now charges an extra $200 to do that power of attorney on the settlement. Once again, like number one, that's a change in the settlement, so that could trigger a new closing disclosure. If the interest rate locks, if the lender created a closing disclosure before the interest was locked in and now it's changed, that would allow the lender to issue a new closing disclosure. If the lock expires, and 
I don't know how much you know, but when a mortgage broker locks in a buyer to get that interest rate, they would lock them for like 30 days. And that way, if it changes, he's locked in at that rate. All right. Now, if thir day 31 comes and they haven't closed for all any reason at all, that interest rate now is expired and he gets the new one. All right. That could be a problem. So you have to relock a new loan. Well, that was a significant change would trigger the interest rate. This is one you run into a lot when you see, hey, we scheduled the closing for the day 30 and the lender locked it for 30 days. And then all of a sudden you need to push the closing to day 31 or 32. And the real estate agents go, I had no problem. We'll amend it. Uh, let's just push the closing back due to that whole time is of the essence conversation. Seems fairly innocuous, right? No. Now the lender goes, wait a minute, we got a problem because the buyer is no longer locked in at that interest rate. If you move that one day, it expired. Now I got to relock him at a potentially higher interest rate, but that also may trigger a new closing disclosure, which requires three days for the lender to preview again. So potentially you can't close on day 31. If the lock expired, I have to relock the guy. New CD, new CD causes new three day time frame. It may be day 34 or 35 before you close. So that expiration is one that is a big one that you have to keep in mind. And then there's one for a construction. Very seldom have I ever seen this one used. If the closing is going to be more than 60 days out, there is a whole bunch of things that could change. So they may reissue a new one as you get closer to closing so that they, hey, you know, things, there's more fees for the construction, which is a change in the settlement charges. There's a different interest rate. So a construction loan delay can actually cause a significant change as well. So these two documents now take the place of four of the old ones. They, the truth in lending, the settlements, uh, the good faith estimate, and the HUD one. Now we have two of them called the loan estimate and the closing disclosure. It's confusing, I understand. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to email me. I'm at Raymond at realuniversity.com. We've got a lot more to talk about with financing, so stick around. We're going to be right back.